Good afternoon. This is Dr. John Bennett, broadcasting from sunny Miami. Tonight we have another in the series of neurosurgical TV hangouts. Uh, Richard Richard Mandel. He's going to talk about lumbar spine pathology, and we're also graced by the presence of Catherine Coe, another uh, neurosurgeon from New York, who's also going to start a channel with neurosurgery and artists. So we'll go around the panel first and introduce ourselves. We'll start with you, Catherine. Hi, I'm. Uh... Uh, practicing neurosurgeon in Brooklyn at Kings County. We do a lot of trauma. We do everything from spine to head. And I also am a multimedia artist. I hold a master's degree in fine art with an emphasis on medical illustration. I'm so glad to be here. Well, welcome, Catherine and uh, Simon. Hello, everyone. Uh, Simon here in Tokyo, um, med student and also a clinical psychologist. Nice to be here. Welcome, Simon. He's a trooper. It's 3, 3 a.m. In, in Japan. Uh, Jesse. Hi, everyone. Jesse Contra coming to you from Philadelphia. I'm a, a graduate student here. Welcome, Jesse. And uh, He Young. you got to unmute He. There you go. Okay, uh, He, he you got to unmute. I, I make that mistake all the time. Oh. Unmute, unmute. Okay. That's okay. We'll, we'll, we'll go on. And also, we have a late arrival, Thomas from Poland, a neurosurgeon from Poland. Thomas, can you hear me? Tomas. <laughs> Tomas, can you hear me? Well, okay. We'll we'll just uh, carry on. We'll introduce them later. Okay. Well, welcome, Richard. It's all yours. Okay. Um, how's the projection? Is is this clear for you? Yes, it is. It looks uh, great. Yes, it is. Okay. Um, Let's see if I can advance it. <laughs> you usually click on the slide, it works. Yeah. Um, uh, yes, um, uh, yeah, I can give me a second, we'll play with this. Okay. Uh, do, you, do you want to advance it or not? Yeah, I want to advance. Um, uh, if you click on the icon on the left, that sometimes uh, can works. You hear me? Can you see me? The icon. Um, it's okay. I'm not. Um, I'm, this is a PowerPoint, but um, I'm not clear. You know, the the photographs of all of you are over the control over the control bar, so I'm not really able to access it. Let me try something else. One yeah. Second. Okay. We, it's all right. Mm. We'll get better at the tech. Yeah, this is awful. I'm sorry. All right. Um, well, maybe we can take the time now. Uh, Richard, Richard or Thomas? Oh, excuse me. He Young, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, I. Yes. Okay. Yes, yeah, I do. Yeah. Could yeah. you introduce yourself, He, while we're waiting for? Technical glitch to be fixed. Yeah, I'm a yes doctor in Seoul, South Korea. Uh, this is very late night. Very good, Thank he, you. And, and Thank welcome. You. Yeah, he's, he's done a couple of hangouts from Korea. From Korea, and Thomas, I don't know if you can hear me yet. Um, I guess not. I guess we'll wait on Thomas. Mm -hmm. Mm. It's time for coffee. Yeah. Um. The screen's getting larger. Yeah. Okay. That's okay. Now you're off it. Um. I'm making a mess of this. It's all right. You always get through. Yes. Yeah, your screen's sharing the wrong screen, I think. Uh, but yeah. Uh, Let me. You know what? I'll just restart it and come back on. Yeah. Okay. Thomas, can you hear me? Thomas. Well, Catherine, these are things that happen. 
And you could you could start it again, and then we just re-edit it. And and you know, well, look, I hate to do that. Uh, I'll I'll edit it, but um, uh, that will mean I have to send the link. I mean, you could every... say yeah, I mean, you could say hello again. You could say hello again. Oh yeah yeah yeah. Hey, that's a good idea. Well, yeah, Catherine, these are things we do. Uh, that <laughs> if if we screw up at the beginning, I just I just yeah. start again. I just start again. So take your time, Richard. We'll just yeah, start again. Exactly. We'll just start again. I just edited out the whole first part. So take your time. We'll uh, we'll just start the whole thing over again once you get the uh... yeah. But Catherine, yeah, these are things that Simon and I have to get be become good at. Is kind of filling in the mm -hmm. blank spots, filling in the dead spots. Because <laughs> uh, sometimes there'll be technical glitches. Yeah, I actually don't. Do you guys hear me? I actually don't have a real good connection for some reason. Still, yeah, I'm trying to work it out over here. Yeah, your yeah, your voice sounds okay. Your video's fine. Mm -hmm. Yes. My my picture's okay. Yeah. Do you what do you have a Wi-Fi? Uh yeah. Yeah. Uh, the best connection which Simon and I have. I don't know, Jesse. You have a a wired broadband. Do you have a wired broadband, Jesse? I do. Yeah. It's yeah. It's a good picture. Good audio. And he, do you have a wired broadband? Is it Wi-Fi? Me? Do yeah. Me? Is it wired to he or is it Wi-Fi? Well, I don't. I don't use Wi-Fi. Oh yeah. You know, Catherine, if you could get a wired connection, it's the best. Yeah. Uh, Wi-Fi is kind of unpredictable because sometimes when a lot of people yeah. use it, your connect your screen will freeze. Yeah. Since you're going to yeah, be in the big time. Happening. Yeah. Since you're going to be in the big time. Uh, I think a broadband might be worse investment. Um, a wired one, a wired one, because you I mean, can you're see talking some... about, You're talking about an RJ11 connection, uh, cable connection, right? Yeah, well, cable or or you can get it through the phone line. Uh, That's for the camera. Yeah, right. yeah. Comcast does it. AT and T does it. Um, right. Everybody does it. Um, T-Mobile, I think, no, not T-Mobile, but... And for a clear camera, I found Logical is a very good one. Logical, the 900 series is reasonable, and it, uh, I th we, we have the same one, Dr. Okay. Bennett, and I have the same camera. No, I, th I think she's talking about the connection, Simon. Are you talking about the yeah. camera, Catherine? She's talking about the connection, I was just adding... Something no, I'm okay. talking about the, the connection. You're talking about just a just a straight cable to the modem, right? Yeah, so that would be the right? best. The okay, best. Yeah, that yeah, yeah. Be no, that's an RJ11. That's a, that's what they call it an RJ11 connection. Yeah, that that would be the best. And I'll give you a link. Okay, yeah, uh, no, no, I have that. I have that. Okay, I'll give you a link to. Uh, yeah, right. and we'll give you a link for a good camera. I mean, what do you, what is any progress, Richard? Yeah, let's see. Um, well, why don't you try it first before we start? Yeah. Um, there we go. Can you see that now clearly? Not yet. You're not, yeah. you're, not sh you're not sharing the screen, no. Okay. Let me try it again. How long? How about that? Not yet. Uh, you gotta click on the. Uh, you gotta go to screen share and then go to the next screen and click on the icon. Icon. All right. All right. Tomas, how you Tomas, doing? How you doing? Uh, hello. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. Yeah, uh, my Tomas. name is uh, my name is Tom uh, uh, Tomas uh, Skaba. I'm certified uh, new surgeon from Poland, and uh, I'm working in. Um, uh, at the uh, Silesian uh, University of Medicine Hospital Department uh, of Neurosurgery. Uh, I am very glad to uh, meet everybody and I'm very glad uh, uh, to participate in the webinar. Okay, welcome. okay. Welcome. Uh, welcome. Tomas, we, we haven't started, started, started yet. I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself again. again. Okay. 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 <laughs> not, not yet. Not yet. Not yet. I think he has two windows open. Yeah, Thomas, you're on two screens. That's why we have an echo. Yeah, Thomas. Yeah, Thomas. Thomas. Yes. You're on two screens. You're on two. You came in on two connections. 
Do you have your iPhone, you have on? Your iPhone on? Uh, yes, uh, at yeah, present I, I, I at, uh, at present uh, I talk uh, uh, from uh, my uh, iPhone. But you have two you connections. Have two connection. Turn the other connection the other off. Connection off. Uh, yes. Uh, just a moment. Uh, I, I'm, I'm talking at present to my, uh, the, um, uh, with my smartphone. smartphone. Okay, but only, okay, use, but only one use one connection. Connection. Because you're on, if you're the, on panel, the panel. Two connections. Two connections. Mm, I, yes, I, but, um, I try. Okay. 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 Excuse me. No. Um, um, you can also you can also knock it out with the control board. Yeah, I'm gonna. Have yeah, to, I'm gonna have to. Uh, uh, control board can take care of that. Yeah, I I did. Uh, unfortunately. Oops. Okay, Richard, how you doing? I'm fine. Can you see the slide? I can see the Google screen. I don't think you want to screen that, right? No, but you you don't see the the slides at all. No, no, I just see the Google screen. Oh boy. All right, hold on. Okay. <laughs> um. Awesome. You know, Catherine, I remarked to some people when they say, well, what about the technical difficulties in the hangouts? I say, uh, well, when you work with surgeons, they usually get through it because they're used to running into problems and they work around it. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it's rare that yep. they'll throw instruments around. They'll usually concentrate on the problem and just calmly work around it. So yep. now, if now we see you. <laughs> okay. Now, if I go to Hangouts and open that, you open the screen share. Okay. And do you see the screen that you want to share on that or not? Well, okay, there you go, Richard. There you go. Okay. Hey, why don't you just leave that on? So to prevent I try to try to move the slides. Try to move. Yeah, uh, let's point. see if you can move the slides. That's good. Good, Simon. Let's okay. see if you can move the slides. Yeah, you're moving them. Yeah. Okay, move it more, please. Can you move it more to make sure? Yeah, let's try it. Move it. There you go. Cases. Yeah, okay, that, that's good. That's good. Okay. Okay, here we go. We're going to restart. All right. Okay, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4. Good afternoon. This is Dr. John Bennett broadcasting from Miami. Today we have another in a series of neurosurgical hangouts. And today Richard Mendel from... Uh, from St. Petersburg, Florida, is going to be talking about lumbar spine pathology. You're also graced with the presence of Catherine Cove, neurosurgeon from New York. So we're going to, going to go on the panel first and introduce everyone, and we'll start with Catherine. Hi. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm a practicing neurosurgeon in Brooklyn, New York, and I'm also a multimedia artist with an emphasis on medical arts. Good to be here. Very good. And Catherine will be starting a channel on interviewing uh, MDs in, in the arts. And Simon. Hello, everyone. Uh, from Tokyo, Japan. Uh, I'm a medical student and clinical psychologist. I'm looking forward to this hangout. And welcome, Simon. 3 a.m. in, in uh, Japan. Jesse. Hi, everyone. Jesse Contra here, joining you from Philadelphia. I'm uh, a graduate student. Nice to be here. Welcome, uh, Jesse. And he young. Hello, I'm Dr. Hee Young Kim in Seoul, Republic of Korea. I work in my private ENT clinic. Thank you for your invitation. Oh, and welcome, Hee. It's also uh, 3 o'clock in the morning in Seoul. I thank you, <laughs> I thank you for, coming, for being dedicated. Uh, yeah, sure, yeah. Yours. Okay, Richard. It's my pleasure. It's all, it's all yours. Okay. Let's make sure everything's in working order now. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think that there just must be some conflict. Here, let me just do it this one. Okay. You know, it's just not letting me advance enough. Maybe it's a built-in conflict from Google to... to um, it worked before. We yeah, but try to do the same thing. There you go. Um, uh, you usually get it working through it. We can always have a take three. That's how it is in Hollywood. <laughs> Yeah, well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See, I can see it moving around the screen. Have you used PowerPoint before to do? Oh, there yeah. you go. It, it moved. Okay, there it is. Moving now. Yep. Okay. Perfect. Okay. All right. There you go. So th this really, for Catherine and Tomas, this is really way above your levels. I mean, way below your levels. But that's okay. It's just something I, I wanted to do something uh, uh, relatively brief, but that you could always w use as kind of a primer because. In medical school, you know, we just didn't learn the, we learned about the spine, but the anatomy of the spine is so, uh, so much more than just a pedicle or a vertebral body and a lamina that a lot of times you start your rotations and, and you really don't know how to localize a disc in, on an MRI. So I'm just going to give you some things that I think help you plan for something is common or garden variety as a lumbar disc herniation. So this is an MRI of uh, someone who um, has a relatively good looking MRI for his age. Uh, he's got a small tarlop cyst but it's, it's um, asymptomatic and a, a nice full lumbar thecal sac. But um, of course it could be much more difficult than, than that. So um, I wanted to show, this is a, a recent MRI of somebody I saw in clinic last week. And this cut here, th this is, of course is a, a, a sagittal image. And this cut, I think it's cut 36, it is this um, axial image here. And what you see is a large herniated disc in the right lateral recess and some fluid in this joint here. But as a student, you may not really know how to open up and find that. And nowadays, with the spine surgery becoming so minimally invasive, you really want to try to localize things very carefully and uh, you know, also make your life a lot easier. So this is a woman. And Catherine, she was not in one of your affiliate hospitals, but she was in another very prestigious hospital system. She went into an ER because she was walking around and she had terrible um, uh, back pain and right lower extremity pain. And it was, you know, following a sciatic distribution. But she, as she was walking in, in Manhattan, she all of a sudden had this terrible pain and then she had all the pain in a, in a femoral distribution. And so we're going to come back to her later. But I just wanted to show this, this x-ray because, you know, the pedicle length here is kind of important because if the pedicle length is genetically long, you're going to have a big wide canal. But if you have genetically short pedicles, the canal is going to be significantly reduced. Um, and that's often the difference between somebody that has routine um, 
stenosis that is degenerative versus somebody that has a congenital stenosis. So the pedicle length is important. And um, now what we'll look at is a few diagrams. This is from the um, OKU4, the Orthopedic Knowledge Update 4, which was the spine section. And it was done by uh, Raj Rao. And um, um, it, it, these line drawings are really uh, pretty good to look at when you're really first trying to find your way around the spine. So, of course, here's the pedicle, right? So you can imagine if the pedicle is going to be reduced, the circumference is going to be reduced. Um, here, um, you're looking at the pedicle, which a lot of people talk about as the bridge from the front to the back of the spine. These are your posterior elements. And here's your intervertebral foramen. And, and, you know, the pars is the portion uh, of the um, uh, bone posteriorly that, that's really very important for um, um, stability. Now, the facet joints can be a little bit confusing. You'll see that the inferior articular process is the top process to the facet joint. The superior articular process is called that because it comes off the superior side of L5. The inferior articular process here is the inferior process of 4. So it, do it does make sense, but it could be a little counterintuitive. But this is your facet joint. And so in the lumbar spine, you have a root exiting, which will be the, um, the exiting root here will be the numbered vertebrae. Um, so, for instance, as you look at a cutaway of the, the spine, this is at, at the beginning of the pedicle. Now, remember the pedicle has a waist, so the, the um, pedicle thins out quite a bit, uh, in the middle portion of the pedicle and then kind of opens up again. So the pedicle can look large here, but it can actually be quite small with very, with a lot less cancellous bone than you would expect. But as you see here, you're going to see the L4 root exiting below the L4 pedicle, which is different than the cervical spine. L5 root exiting below the L5 pedicle. But this, of all the slides, today. This is the most important one. And this one, let's see, well, these two are the most important. John, uh, Dr. McCullough, John McCullough, he was in Dayton, Ohio for many, many years. He wrote an excellent, he was an orthopod who wrote an excellent uh, book on microsurgery of the lumbar spine. And he, he would talk about this y-axis house analogy where the pedicle was the roof of the house. And then you know, this is in a um, y-axis, so in a cutaway view, think of the pedicle as the roof of the house, and then think of the area below the pedicle as the infrapedicular level, and then you'll have the discal level. Then you start over again with the, the next segment. But the x-axis, um, that kind of got described um, not not at the same time with the with Dr. McCullough's y-axis analogy, but there you have central lateral axis foraminal and extra foraminal. So this is a great diagram that came out of the Orthopedic Knowledge Update 4, but it's been recopied from Dr. McCullough's publications. Um, so he, here here you are at the pedicle level. So PID. Pedicle, infrapedicular, and discal. So you want to um, kind of look at your MRIs in a way that you can locate this, the um, disc herniation or fragment in three dimensions. But you only need to know the X and the Y. The, the MRI tells you the Z, but that's not the decision you have to make at, at surgery. At surgery, you need to know where in that inner space to start looking. And um, so a cent the central disc herniation is really the widest area. It's really the whole canal. But you'll see the lateral recess is where the nerve begins to exit the foramen 
Um, and then you have your foraminal disc herniations, which tend to really, really hurt a lot because if it's out in the frame and the nerve is often pushed back into the bony anatomy there in the back of the canal, usually into the um, superior articular process, then, then you, you have an extra foraminal disc. And I must say, I haven't seen many extra foraminal discs in quite a while until one I'm going to show you. So recently in clinic, I, I've just seen huge soft disc herniations that I, I rarely ever see, especially in Florida where you have a, a big elderly population and usually, you know, after about the sixth decade, the some of those discs are pretty desiccated, but this is a tremendously large disc herniation with L5-S1, and you're able to localize it right to the discal level and the inferior particular level. So with good fluoro and marking the, the space where you want to enter in terms of X and Y, you, you have a pretty good idea of, of finding this. Now, here is another. This is a separate patient. This is a young woman, and this is a tremendously large disc herniation here at L5. And of course, it, it's it's a central herniation, but it takes up a giant portion of the canal. Okay. Now, <clears throat> this um, this is an image to kind of demonstrate to you again the x-axis. So here again. This large space, this interlaminar space, which is where you would place an epidural start injection right into this epidural space, for the most part, this is a central disc herniation across here. The lateral recess will begin about here and here. Then you're going to be in the foramen, which is small, but you know, once, once the disc is in the foramen, patients tend to have tremendous pain and you really have to be um, scrupulous in looking at the lateral cuts. Don't look at just the middle of the MRI. You have to look at the lateral cuts um, to rule out a foramen or an extra foramen or disc formulation. So, um, this again is the woman who was in Manhattan. And what what happened, I think, is going to be evident in a minute, but she came to me, and she hadn't had any MRIs yet. Boy, she was in tremendous pain, and like I said, she described her pain as going down the um, back of her leg in a sciatic kind of distribution, but she had hurt for a while before she, the, the, this particular day in Manhattan, but it got so bad in Manhattan, she described this feeling where back was just terrible, and then the pain started to go down the front of the leg. And this is what I think happened. And um, take a look at this MRI and, and look carefully at it. But um, do, do you look at this four or five disc. I mean, her problem localizes to really up to the thigh, thigh level. And I um, just take a look at this axial cut here and see what you think. This is a huge extra foraminal disc herniation. I, ha I think it's the largest one I've ever seen out there. But this foraminal disc herniation is a giant piece of disc that broke off. And I think while she was walking, she extruded it out the frame and and then was hitting the um, more the uh, fourth nerve root, and that's when she was started to get a lot of femoral symptoms. And you know, to go in the midline here to operate on her, you would have to go quite a ways to get out to this disc. But the best incision for this was really a um, um, what's called a Wilkesy. Leon Wilkesy was an orthopod. He used to do this Wilkesy incision. It's about three and a half to four 
setting the Israel from the ground. And you could feel this. You could palpate on the back and feel where these muscle fat, you know, large fascicles are. And so the incision was made here, and then you just could place a finger right down through this fatty plane, and you'll come right up to what? The fourth nerve root. And I brought a microscope in, and all I had to do was just take a um, um, nerve hook and dissect the root slate and try to mobilize it a little bit. And then all I did was simply squeeze the disc right out, and it, it came out beautifully. But this is very unusual. I mean, I, I don't think I've ever seen one this large um, in all the time I've been practicing. But um, that was essentially it. I just wanted to give you a kind of format for how to, how to understand where, where a disc is going to be in relation to what you see on the MRI. Um, that's, that's essentially it. I'll try to keep it short. <laughs> Very, very good, Richard. Thank you very much for a clear presentation. Uh, we had a, some technical difficulties, but we got going. Yeah, yeah. I'd like, yeah, to, yeah. I'd like to quickly uh, introduce Carlos Numaguano. Hello, Carlos. Can you hear me? Hello, hello, John. Uh, Catherine, uh, excuse me, Carlos. To your right is uh, Catherine Coe, a neurosurgeon from New York. Carlos, hey. unmute yourself. Unmute, unmute yourself there. Hey, Ben. And uh, you, I think you've met Richard before. Yeah. Hey, Carlos. Okay. Okay. Okay, uh, Catherine. I guess you'll start off. With any comments or questions for, for Richard? I think that's a very good presentation. And actually, you uh, underestimate you overestimated me. <laughs> I learned a lot. It's, you know, particularly important reminded me about the pedicle links. I think that's key, not only in uh, lumbar disc surgery, but also looking at that pedicle is very important for fusion. I've become very, very appreciative of the pedicle. And uh, the other thing I wanted to say is that I think people underestimate the anatomy of the spine, and they think, well, the brain is so much more complex. I, I disagree. I think that uh, when you're operating on the disc, the field of view is so small that you really have to nail your anatomy. So thank you again for emphasizing those very important points. Sure. Yeah, yeah. I think that whenever I have trouble localizing a disc, it's because I skip. I don't preoperatively plan as well as I should. If you just go through this little plan, I try to do it every, every disc acting. If you go through the little plan, it seems like things go an awful lot easier than, um, than um, when you skip that step. Um, yeah. can, uh, Richard, can you give a percentage? How many people have long pedicles and so how many have short? It's well, it's kind of, it's kind of a, a genetic thing, and a lot of people are very interested in that. It, it's, big, it's a big research project among the veterinary uh, schools because you know, things like animals like dachshunds, have tremendously short pedicles. And a lot of achondroplastic dwarfs have very short pedicles as well. And the guys that see those cases the most are often the scoliosis surgeons. But yeah, a short pedicle results in a greatly diminished diameter or uh, circumference of the canal. And and that's, um, that's bad news because removing the lamina in somebody that has congenital uh, stenosis does effectively nothing. You kind of destabilize them by doing that. Um, you, you really need to try to give them more room by doing a, um, intervertebral like a, a lateral approach where you're going to give them more surface area, not by opening the canal up from behind, but by placing a larger graft into a disc space that's not quite as high and giving them more room that way. It's more of what would be an indirect compression. But when you take the lamina off, I mean, in my experience, the lamina is usually of the three columns in the spine, the anterior, middle, and posterior, 
the post year columns almost never involved. And that, that, that's including with oncology. It's almost always the anterior or middle columns where you see um, oncologic problems and where you see degenerative problems. Um, when you get a thickened perception and the patient gets older and the yellow ligament thickens, they do get um, a focal stenosis at the disc level. It is treated with a, a laminar decompression just over the disc level, but you don't want to decompress over the um, infrapedicular level, and of course you can't decompress at the pedicular level. So, yeah. So, Richard, so every time you take someone to the R, you look at the x-rays to, make, to, to get a gauge of if it's a, the size of the pedicle, every patient you bring? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think you have to. I mean, that should be your pre-op routine, because, you know, even though it may be a, a garden variety disc, it's, you know, to that patient it's a big deal. And it, it just makes it so much easier to make your marks, your X and your Y marks on floor, on the skin, and you know, like for instance, the woman that had that large extra foraminal disc, I held the nerve root up to her, to her side, just to judge where where I wanted to be, and I put it right over the frame and where I thought the disc was going to be, and that that kind of told me that I was in the right place in terms of my y-axis, you know. Mm -hmm. so, well, you know, uh, that's interesting, Rich. I, I thought, I know you meticulously go over the MRI before you take it, but what other, is there any other things you look at it on the regular x-ray, uh, or mostly just pedicle length, that's what it is? I like to look at the x-rays, especially for cervical spine. I, I think I get a lot out of the x-rays in cervical spine, but, um, yeah, for lumbar spine, you want to know what their lordosis is like, and and you're interested to know if they've lost disc space height, a lot of disc space height, because um, that can often identify your level. But the MRIs really pretty much become, you know, the routine, the gold standard these days. Right, that's that's the thing you really go over. Uh, do you ever, I know you're joined late, uh, Carlos, but uh, do you have any comments or questions on looking at the like like X-rays before uh, operating on the L spine? Yeah, does he have a routine or any tricks he goes through? I don't know. Do you, Carlos, do you operate much on the L-spine, Carlos? I don't know if you can hear. Yeah, that's it. Can you hear okay, Carlos? Now you're now you're muted. Now unmute, please. There you go. <laughs> okay, okay, we'll go on. A any other uh, questions from the panel or comments? Simon? Um, you're, you're I have a question. I think, uh, I think Carlos is able to talk now. Oh, okay. Carlos, yeah. can you talk now? I think he's unmuting when he's talking. He's oh, I see. Good, good I think factor. Dr. Carlos is uh, muting when you're talking oppositely. Uh, Hello, perhaps. Carlos. You're unmuted now. You can speak. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Something's okay. wrong. Uh, Oh, in Spanish, they call it Albert Vez, in reverse. That's okay. always asking a question Simon, then. Do you, do you have a question or a comment, sure. Simon? Um, sure, this is a uh, medical student question. I'm fascinated with the anatomy. Thank you very much for, for showing that. And, of course, it's it's much more than I, I'm used to. Um, but uh, I sort of have this, this fear that you know, perhaps you, you get to participate in a surgery. Imagine you got to be... Um, a resident and then you didn't know where you were. The one time you had mentioned that one of your professors had actually had brought out an atlas or they had uh, actually looked at a, uh, uh, some yeah. some photos and I was wondering what, what, what in the situation, of course there's preparation before. He was when a, you, hmm. Yeah, I, I know what you mean. He was a very, very famous neurosurgeon at the University of Pennsylvania. He was a brilliant man, but he used to keep Gray's Anatomy in his in his locker. He would just carry it with him when he was doing peripheral nerve things or things he didn't do very often. But he, that, he happened to be a, a brilliant guy, and he used to say, "No, you know, there, there's no shame in using a map in a neighborhood you don't travel in much." And so, you know, 
Uh, I'm not embarrassed about that. I keep a model okay. in the OR anyway. It's continual learning then. That's you don't you. By the time you're a resident or you know everything, that's not the case. You continue and yeah, learn. Residents, we all think we know everything. But we, yeah, the the, the uh, um, yeah, I, I you just you, you just have to know if you, you're not familiar with something, you have to get familiar. And okay. You don't want to be embarrassed about it. You just want to do do the job. Yeah. I see. Right. Thank you. you. You know, you know, Richard, and, and maybe Catherine could come on this too. Uh, now that three D printing is becoming more prominent, with actually printing three D printing the body parts before the surgeon goes in there. I know cardiovascular surgeons are using that to show anomalous uh, vessels in the heart. They're, they're actually three D printing, uh, especially in, in children. They're getting 3D prints of the anatomy before they cut. Uh, do, have you heard, Catherine, you can comment on this too. Have you heard of any neurosurgeons 3D printing any parts of the brain or spinal cord before they cut? Uh, not, no, I haven't heard of any. Okay, maybe that's but, not been. Um, there's a yeah, it calls to mind, you know, when you talk about the anatomy, and sometimes, you know, you get in there and you're momentarily you don't know where you are, that uh, when we went from open discectomies to using the tube, uh, there was a learning curve, even though the anatomy was the same, the field of view was so much smaller. Yeah. And what I always felt was that once I knew where the pedicle was, uh, I, I, it's home, the bone is home, and so once I knew where the pedicle was, no matter what size tube I was using, it gave me a lot of confidence. So you'll pick your landmarks, your familiar landmarks, which will like um, kind of pebbles on the trail to show you where you are. And some people have different landmarks, but for me, if I know where that pedicle is, I'm good. So that, that that's the place you really look for the pedicle first when you first get there. Yeah, pedicle. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. If you look in Ed Benzel's recent book, I guess this is the the spine surgery text on complication avoidance. You know, I was looking at the anatomy there of, of of the spine in a sagittal view, and there are so many names that you don't I don't ever think of. But I, I had a friend who was an orthopod. He always he was always comfortable as long as he was on bone, but he would look for the mammary mm -hmm. process all the time when we were for pedicle screws, but as soon as he saw that, he was comfortable. You know, we, we all have our different comfort levels, and you don't necessarily need to memorize every name. You just have to be comfortable at, you know, finding your uh, safe places where, where you, you start. That's all. Mm -hmm. um, you know, to, to, uh, the spine, to spine surgeons, the anatomy is so complicated, but as medical students, I don't remember much other than remembering the thoracic spinous processes were angled way down and I didn't know much difference between cervical and lumbar at that time but now you can spend 45 minutes talking about one vertebral body segment so yeah I mean if you focus on any part of the body your your zoom gets your zoomed in area gets gets quite quite a bit bigger and you know do, do you use special glasses? Do you use the microscope glasses uh, in the spine, or that? Um, I used to. Now uh, I just um, tend to wear. Um, I wear a, a goggle, not not a loop, not a loop. That's a little like two point five. But really, if I'm getting old enough that if I have to squint, I just bring the microscope in, period. <laughs> really? I, I, don't, I, I don't really want to play around with the glasses because my vision is so bad. When, yeah. when the circulators take my glasses off, I can barely tell whether it's light, you know, night or day. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, to bring in the scope because I don't need glasses when I'm under the scope. But, yeah, I just, I just don't like fiddling around with that. So I wear contacts and shield. And then I use, just use the scope. If I start squinting, I just get the scope. <laughs> okay, Carlos, is your audio okay? Do you have any comments, Carlos? Uh, sorry. Okay. Oh. Okay. Well, Catherine, do you do much work on the spine, or is it mostly brain you work on? 
Uh, both. Oh, okay. A lot of a uh, lot of spinal instrumentation. Yeah, a lot of spinal instrumentation. But when I do a discectomy, I definitely use a microscope. I don't even put loops on. I just make an incision and bring the scope right in. Yeah, yeah. It's. Uh, I think you're losing. It's certainly, if, if the anatomy is confusing macroscopically, I can imagine with a microscope, it's d triple confusing. So you you have to kind of get your landmarks before you get to the microscope, right? Um. A lot of times, I just open well enough that I, I, I know I've uncovered the area I need and then bring the scope in. And then I, then I can, as soon as I bring the scope in, I just kind of get oriented. I, I'd, probably, I'd probably go through a checklist, but I'm not conscious of it. I, I kind of look around, then I figure out where I am. Sometimes I'll put an instrument in uh, and touch a few things, but yeah, you, you just get used to it. By repetition. Okay. Okay. Any questions uh, from the rest of the panel? Okay. Okay. I guess uh, Carlos, uh, it's a wash for your audio today. We'll get it. We'll get it figured out before the next hangout. Yeah, I'll, I'll try not. I'll try to use Google Slides again. I think it goes smoother when you're using the Google apps. Okay. Um, uh, I just threw this together on on. Um, PowerPoint. I don't really okay. know. No, hey, we can't be too self-critical. We'll get better at this. This is this, this no. And Richard, I, I thank you for coming out today as usual. And thank you, Catherine, for coming by, and Carlos, and the rest of the panel. And hang thank around. You. We'll we'll chat after it's over. Thank you very much. All right.